I'm Scott Lucas. This is World Unfiltered. About a decade ago, the key words in Turkish foreign policy were zero problems and strategy in depth. But in 2021, the man credited with those concepts, Ahmet Davutoglu, is no longer foreign minister. He's no longer in the ruling Justice and Development Party. Instead, President Erdogan and his government face a series of challenges in the region and beyond. What are relations going to be like with the European Union, having failed to get accession after years, in fact, decades? Relations with the United States, with the threat of Washington sanctions, tension on the economic, political, and military fronts. But on the other side, President Erdogan has made a great deal of his potential relationship, personal and wider, with Vladimir Putin of Russia. All these relationships, including the question of the Chinese presence as it expands, well, there are matters closer to home. The Syria conflict, which now is in its 11th year and in which Turkey has a prominent role. The ongoing conflict and tensions in Libya, where Turkey has a prominent role. The division between the Gulf states in which Turkey was allied with Qatar against Saudi Arabia and the UAE. All of these and other interesting issues in the region also connect up to issues even, even closer at home, if that makes sense. In other words, within Turkish borders, the economic situation, far from good at present, and the Kurdish question. Can we connect all of this up with the idea of a Turkish grand strategy? Well, I need to go to the expert on this. And Mustafa Aydin has written for quite some time on Turkish foreign policy, regional politics, and grand strategy, including a recent article in November that looks at the historical and contemporary context. He's also involved in the day-to-day -day consideration of this on the practical level, president of the International Relations Council of Turkey, and he's the former rector of Kata Haas University in Istanbul. Professor Aydin, thanks for joining us on World Unfiltered. Thank you for the invitation, Scott. Nice to be here. Well, it's a real pleasure, especially because I can come as a student and start off with a student's basic question. In 2021, can we speak of a Turkish grand strategy? Well, that's a million dollar question, Scott. You started with the most difficult one. Um, if you are looking for a plan that is something written and which everybody can read, we cannot speak about that uh, in Turkey. Or if we are talking about a plan that uh, has a long-term uh, strategy linked to it and a long-term aim to achieve a, some unknown or known uh, final point, then I would argue that there is a strategy or there should be a strategy. In Turkey, this is something even uh, on the popular level, people keep talking about as if Turkey never has a strategy. I remember during my uh, university years as a student, one of our professors used to tell us that Turkish foreign ministry, the bureaucrats, the ambassadors in the foreign ministry are just like firemen. You know, they run around uh, when they see a fire and they try to uh, extinguish it. And that's the Turkish foreign policy, he says, He's, he used to say. But if you look at the foreign policies uh, of the countries in the world, academically about 95 to 98% of the actions of countries, for the all countries actually, mm. are made up reactions to daily happenings in international arena. So it's not as if everybody keeps planning all the time and all the countries keep following their plans. Usually the plans are there to give a leader or a, a group of people who are governing the country a sense of direction. So my argument is that for Turkey and for any other country, even if we don't have a, a document telling us where the country is going, we can understand uh, the country's strategy or at least the direction by studying the history of the country, uh, by studying the history of the foreign policy and the behavior, uh, international behavior of that country, whether that country have a strategy. So in that sense, I would argue that Turkey has some strategy, although many people might disagree with me in Turkey, especially. 
okay, let's test what the strategy is because you talk about a, a series of possibilities in your recent article. Are we talking about a balancing grand strategy to balance between, uh, and I don't want to be as simplistic as West and East, but multiple powers, whether we talk about the US, whether we talk about European powers, whether we talk about Russia or further afield, the Chinese, is balance the watchword for this government right now? Well, in fact, this is, uh, this is also my, one of my arguments is that the balancing in Turkish foreign policy has been so deep rooted. It has become something uh, a word that we have to watch all the time, whichever the government is, which includes the current government. And I would argue in my paper also, that's what I argued, that we can trace back the history of this balancing action to back to the Ottoman Empire, you know, like uh, to the late 18 or late mid 19th centuries. Since then, the, the state, the empire, and then the Turkish Republic time and again, come back to the same strategy, balancing, and in, in two terms, actually. The balancing between uh, friends and foes at the one hand, and balancing also among the friends as well. So we see this example from uh, the early Republican era during the War of Independence. We see the same uh, attempt during the Second World War. Uh, and we see even the one most one-sided foreign policy period of 1950s and 60s, when Turkey was actually very much not only pro-Western, but many people would argue Western dependent country in, uh, in the height of the Cold War. Even then, Turkey was trying to balance its foreign connections. You know, many people are keep talking nowadays about Turkey's friendship with Russia and puzzled about it, but, uh, in, Again, the, those people usually do not know that Turkey was a country that received most foreign aid from Soviet Union during the Cold War outside the Warsaw Pact countries. So even though Turkey was a very staunch ally of NATO, and in that sense, if you look at it, enemy of the Soviet Union, but it was still receiving economic and structural aid from the Soviet Union. So this government, too, has been using this balancing strategy, and especially in recent years, uh, I would argue that after Davutoglu uh, left the government, one of the bywords of the current foreign policy is definitely balancing, and in two senses also. One is between the West, traditional allies of Turkey, mm -hmm. and the rest, mainly the Russian Federation, but also the rest. But also, not only that, uh, it, the government also tries to create a kind of balancing between regions, or I would call Turkey's near abroad, borrowing from the Russian terminology, and trying to balance Turkey's relations in the Caucasus, in the Black Sea, Mediterranean, Levant, and etc. Uh, so yes, I think the balancing is one of the bywatches that we have to follow uh, when we're talking about this current uh, foreign policy of Turkey. At the same time, uh, in recent years, President Erdogan has quite often spoken about leadership of the Islamic world. Uh, there has been the question about Turkish leadership in the Middle East, a very rapidly changing Middle East. Is this balancing being accompanied in 2021 with the pursuit of primacy in the Middle East rather than balancing other powers that, who are already there? Uh, well, let me mention from the beginning that attempting leadership is well, when, if you listen in Turkish, the President Erdogan's speeches or any other uh, uh, foreign minister or formerly prime minister, they would not openly say that they are attempting for a leadership. So we, we don't, we haven't heard Erdogan that Turkey should be the leader of the Islamic world. He never says okay. so. But if you again listen to him, you would understand that's what he's meaning and the government is meaning. And this is, again, I would argue, is something quite a long history in Turkish foreign policy. Whenever Turkey felt it is able to, and it has a place uh, to exercise its power in its near abroad or the neighborhood, it, it has always attempted to do so. Not going back too much in the history, but since the end of the Cold War, if you look at it, uh, Turkey tried to be very influential and actually the word we used was a, replacing Soviet Union as a 
great as a big brother. In 1990s, Turkey was trying to establish its influence in Central Asia and Caucasus in that vast region. In the 2000s, we saw the similar attempts in uh, different regions like Black Sea, Balkans, and the Middle East. And in 2010s, since after the Arab Spring, in, in fact, the similar attempt has been done in the, in the Middle East. So there is this kind of a moving target uh, where Turkey is trying to establish its, you might call it dominance, some might call it influence, but whatever we like to call it, Turkey wants to have an influential actor uh, in its neighborhood. The geographies, sub-regions of the world, which borders Turkey. So that's Balkans, Caucasus, and the Middle East. The way to do this is, of, of course, differs in time. In the first years of Davutoglu's foreign ministership, Turkey, and he was emphasizing the soft power of Turkey, Turkey being a model. And in fact, the origin of this argumentation did not really started in Turkey. It was the United States who promoted Turkey as a model to Eurasian countries in 1990s. Uh, in 2000s, after 9-11, this time Turkey was again promoted as a model to the, the Muslim world by the United States and Europe together. And by 2010s, Turkey picked up this, uh, this mod, the model discussion and tried to promote itself as a model to Middle Eastern Muslim countries. But this did not last long, actually, by up until the Arab Spring or Arab Uprising, uh, whichever way uh, you like to call it, uh, this model discussion has kind of faced uh, huge difficulties. The reality caught up with the imagination. And after that, by the 2011 onwards, we have seen Turkey's attempts to use hard power instead of being a model is some uh, kind of forcing a model uh, to its neighborhood and saying that Turkey has become, in Davutoglu's word, it was order builder as far as the Middle East was concerned. The current government in 2020s now is talking about a, a being a regional security actor. Implication is that Turkey is a country which could provide an order and stability and security to regions around itself. It comes to the same thing, actually. Uh, it shows to the intention and, and wishful thinking and ambition to be an influential actor uh, in its regions, which also includes uh, opposing to what sometimes uh, people call foreign influences in these regions. Uh, what it means actually, uh, it's opposing to extra regional countries like United States or any other country to come uh, and be an influential actor in the regions. So this kind of cry creates a clash between Turkey's interests and those of other countries who are trying to come and establish order, stability, or a model, whatever, for these regions. Okay, now this is where it gets challenging for me because you write, and I think you implicitly refer to this, that at, there's a period from about 2013 where there's more of a defensive posture because things do not go very, let's say, they don't follow a coherent path in the Middle East to say the least um, and in North Africa. And if here we are in 2021 with the idea that, that Turkey is this, if they're repackaging order as this security actor, You've got a case like Nagorno-Karabakh, where the question is, how do you get involved when the Russians are there as the primary actor for order? You've got the case like Libya, which arguably is still not moving towards order, but is in continuous disorder. And then you have the Syrian case, where you don't even have a single country. You have a partition country, so there's no sense of an order which exists in that area. Is this Turkish idea of order as a grand strategy, or at least an element of a grand strategy, isn't it really stuck in the idea that we're going to have ongoing disorder for the foreseeable future? Well, the life imposes itself to any plan that you make for yourself mm -hmm. or for your country. Of course, we are talking, when we are talking grand strategies or grand plans, we are actually talking at one level, it's a visual thinking, kind of uh, controlled or limited by your resources and by the international developments. 
So the, these regions that you are talking about, the Middle East, the Caucasus, Libya, in that sense also, are very volatile. Whatever your plans on paper does not uh, exactly can be replicated to the ground. Um, so uh, apart from this general thinking in Turkish aims for itself, to carve up an influential uh, influence area in its neighborhood, there are other factors that affects daily policies. Uh, somehow, uh, if, if you like, you can say that it's, it's uh, the line from today and your aim in 20 years would not be a straight line, it will be crooked line. Uh, and it will be same for all the countries. For Turkey, there are these, um, again, catchwords which forces Turkey to change direction. One is the security. Uh, this country is a very uh, security conscious country. It's a, it's a, it has always been since its uh, establishment has grappled with the idea that uh, there is this fear of dismemberment. Uh, this, come back, this, this comes uh, from the history also, uh, how the late Ottoman Empire was dismembered or dissolved, uh, how this country was established fighting mm -hmm. against different countries uh, which especially the Western, at the time, Western imperialist countries trying to divide the country. That memory is kind of stuck in the minds of Turkish people in general and Turkish decision makers too. So if you uh, do a general survey in Turkey, which I do every year, uh, we ask to the people what they think about the, the countries. We give them like 20, 50 countries, uh, whether they think that they are threatening Turkey. And even the countries as far as Myanmar, uh, which Turkey has no connection whatsoever, is seen as a threatening to Turkey. So, uh, and you know, if, if you look at the allies of Turkey, the official allies of Turkey from NATO, uh, the United States tops the list of threats to Turkey. Um, the Western countries, the Turkey's allies, France, Germany, England is always among the top five or top 10. Uh, so this country is always in the fear of being attacked by other countries and surrounded by enemies. And again, when you ask to the people, uh, who are Turkey's friends in the world? And you would get only one country actually, that's Azerbaijan. Uh, and I would say one and a half, the half is uh, the second distant second is Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, which is recognized only by Turkey. Um, so this is this kind of a siege mentality affects Turkish foreign policy very much, and it affects the decision making as well. So if we look at this, um, the recent years, the penultimate issue that affects Turkish policies, especially in its neighborhood, is the security of the country and the fear of its borders. And this is kind of activated in Turkey in recent years very much in connection with the Kurdish issue. When we look at the Kurds in Iraq and the Kurds in Syria being activated for the developments in, that, in, in their own countries uh, towards autonomy or towards independence in Iraq, autonomy in Syrian cases, that creates uh, a further fears in Turkey and which pushes the government to use military means when necessary to push back that kind of ambitions. And when, when the government sees, or not only the government, I, mean, I would include the wide chunk of Turkish population, when, when they see the, um, the United States cooperating with the Kurdish groups, PYD, especially in Syria, which Turkey considered as an extension of PKK, the terrorist groups that are fighting the Turkish state for years, then the, the kind of a, a, a connection is linked, linkage is created. Then the decision is very easy. We have to oppose this. Uh, when you make that kind of a decision for the primacy of protecting your borders, then United States suddenly becomes a threat, a, 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 a actual threat to the country's borders. And then you seek a balancing the United States with Russia which happens to be in Syria also, uh, and would open up places for Turkey uh, to create uh, what we consider as a safe zone on the border. Then 
everything follows from this initial premises. Similarly, when you look at Libya, the Libya case is again, it was not the case in Turkey until the, the Eastern Mediterranean became a problem for Turkish sovereignty and security in the region. Because from the Turkish perspective, the attempts uh, of the Greek Cypriots and Greece to join up their continental shelves or economic zone, exclusive zones, present a danger to Turkish sovereignty and territorial integrity, actually, on the sea this time. Mm. So you have to oppose this. Then from, from then onwards, one adds to another, and Turkey finds itself uh, in Libya uh, operating militarily. So I can go around all this, but that's the, the one of the first things that we have to think when we are talking about Turkish foreign policy is the security mind or security mindset of Turkish decision makers, how they understand, how they feel, how they fear their uh, existence. That makes so many connections. So uh, if I could follow up, uh, in a way, it's to ask you if this is how the straight line becomes crooked, because whereas there had been an emphasis on soft power, now because of security, you have an emphasis on hard power. And this connection between what is next door and what is at home. So on the Kurdish issue, for example, a few years ago, the idea of soft power might accompany the idea of trying to resolve the Kurdish issue through negotiations and dialogue within Turkey. Now we're in a position where within Turkey, there are moves by the Turkish courts to consider banning uh, the leading pro-Kurdish party, the HDP. A number of its members are in prison, as well as, of course, members of the insurgency, PKK. Isn't there a risk here that that connection in the name of security between next door and at home is actually going to wind up isolating Turkey in that many countries, in effect, will push back against the Turks or keep their distance because of the idea you are being mean to the Kurds, you are being oppressive to the Kurds at home and in Syria? Well, Turkey has been isolated exactly, but not only the, because of the Kurdish issue, okay. but on top of it, how Turkey has been pursuing its interests in its near abroad with the, uh, with the use of force or threat of use of force in Iraq, in Syria, in Eastern Mediterranean, in Libya, etc. And this has created a group of countries which is kind of extending all, all of the southern part of Turkey. Not only the southern borders, but if you remember, imagine the map starting from the Gulf region, uh, taking up to the Libya, there is a group of countries which, is fo which are forming different circles. They are all against Turkey, in a sense, mm. or at least perceived against Turkey from, from the Turkish perspective. You have United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, and Israel, doing their cooperation in the Middle East, not necessarily always against Turkey, or their first aim is, is Turkey, but nevertheless is perceived what they are doing is against Turkey, uh, their policies in Syria, etc. And then you move to the Mediterranean, you have a connection between Greece, Egypt, uh, the Greek Cypriots, and Israel, and that connection is strengthened. And when you move to Libya, then you see the same country. You have uh, Egypt there, Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates supporting behind. And you see Greece supporting uh, diplomatically. And you would see France giving support to uh, the group in the Eastern Mediterranean. You might see from the Turkish perspective that United States supporting this uh, creation in the middle, in the Eastern Mediterranean. So you have all this from a Turkish perspective from or, or decision makers perspective, you have this combination of countries opposing Turkey. And obviously the government sources or the people close to government would, would tell us or tell you that these are kind of organized against Turkey. That's the perception. Uh, obviously they are in some sort of a co coercion or co cooperation with each other. Uh, and their main aim would not be to oppose Turkey, but nevertheless, that's what, what's, what is happening on the ground. And one of the reasons why this is happening is, of course, the Turkey's forceful uh, engagement with its neighbors. We have to accept and we have to acknowledge 
that Turkey does not have an ambassador in Israel at the moment and for some years now, does not have an ambassador in uh, Egypt, obviously do not have an ambassador of which we don't recognize the Greek Cypriots in, in Cyprus. Obviously, we don't have an ambassador in, in Syria. Uh, very difficult problems with several other countries. In English, of course, you say you need two sides to do tango. Turkey, we, we have a similar saying. So if there is a problematic relationship, we have to look to ourselves as well. What Turkey is doing so that alienating all these countries. I remember uh, a few years back, a high level Israeli ambassador, former ambassador was telling us in a, in a meeting that Israel for years stay away from Greece and, 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 and Greek Cypriots because it was pursuing friendship with Turkey, but now they are pursuing friendship with Cyprus and Greece because they have a problem with Turkey. So Turkey pushed Israel towards this, uh, pursuing these alternatives. Of, of course, this is, a, this is a very simplistic view. I'm not arguing that this is why it happened. But nevertheless, this is a kind of a, a picture. It, it complements all the other pictures. So if you are forcing all these countries away from yourself by your policies, by your rhetorics, then it is natural that they will cooperate with each other. Uh, and it is, in a sense, a success of Turkey to creating all this uh, a group of countries in different zones opposing Turkey. Uh, <laughs> Well, success is, in an inverted commas, of course. This is not looking very hopeful for grand strategy. So <laughs> let, let me ask you one more problem. Maybe question. we are we are failing to implement the grand strategy that the geography and history and the reality of this country actually imposes us. Uh, this this see, happens when you reject the, the, the limitations and, and the reality. Let me ask you one more problem question before I get you to solve everything then using geography and history. Uh, the problem question is this. I, I was reading a collection of essays from 2011, you know, 10 years ago, which was all about Turkish grand strategy and said, oh, it, Turkey has this ambitious grand strategy and it is ambitious and it, is, it, is, it, is, it has great hope because it's founded on economic self-confidence. Well, Turkey in 2021 has got a 15% inflation rate. Uh, it's got rising unemployment and the currency is not doing very well to say the least. And I think the head of the central bank has just been replaced as well. Is it possible even to pursue balancing, let alone this idea of being the regional security actor with all these economic issues that are there on the home front? The simple answer is no, it's not possible. Uh, that's why actually we are seeing the change of rhetoric from the government circles. Mm -hmm. uh, starting from president going down. When you follow and look at what's happening in last three, three months, let, let me say, uh, there is a huge change of rhetoric. Obviously, I'm using the word rhetoric by knowing that the rhetoric does not always correspond uh, to the actions, but there is always a time lag or gap between action and the rhetoric. The rhetoric has changed. That's, that's very clear. And it's not only economy, obviously. There are uh, different uh, factors that is affecting this change. One is the economy, obviously, when you don't have enough resources to follow your various uh, ambitions, you have to give up some of ambitions or you have to uh, put them on the back burner for some time. And that's, that's natural. That's one reason. The second is obviously the changing international uh, environment, especially the changing uh, the presidency of, of the United States. Uh, with the new, new, new administration uh, coming in in the United States, uh, the expectations that it might be more active in the, in the areas, uh, the, the regions that neighboring Turkey, which necessitates a kind of a recalibrating the Turkish positions in different regions, if the United States is going to be more active in those regions by simply because it's a, uh, it's a big power. If it comes, you have to account for it. Uh, and also, obviously, there is a, there was, and now it's almost reality uh, after two months in presidency, uh, there is a much talk of US-European Union 
cooperation on various issues, including Turkey. Uh, and if that happens, then uh, what you see, the balancing among your friends is not working. If they all come together and they all agree on one policy, then you cannot play them to each other. So that's the reality of international politics. And of course, also one more issue is that the new U.S. administration, the expectation was that it was going to be more hardliner as far as Russia is concerned, which again would push a country like Turkey to make choices that it does not necessarily want to make, uh, which makes it very difficult again to balancing, playing the balancing game between Russia and Turkey's Western allies. So this is the international. And the third is the realization that the isolation that we just talked a few minutes ago, uh, there is a so much isolation which any country can take. Uh, I think Turkey also came to the limit of that isolation. It's, it's affecting and hurting Turkey's economy. Uh, for example, it's trade with Saudi Arabia, it's trade with Egypt, it's trade with uh, Israel and many other regional countries being affected. It's hurting Turkish political interests in the regions because the countries, your friends can back up you up to a certain level, but eventually they will say, you know, are you always right? I mean, do you have, maybe possibly you might have something, doing something wrong. Why don't you look at it? So this kind of uh, three-dimensional realization, the changing of um, uh, international environment, uh, the economy, and also the realization is forcing to change of Turkish rhetoric. Now, whether this rhetoric, the change of rhetoric will be reflected in practice, uh, we are just seeing the rudimentary stage of that, that effects. Um, Turkey's policies in the Eastern Mediterranean, first of all, uh, have started to be relaxing, or at least uh, diplomacy now takes precedence uh, to the military, uh, or the, at least security toll. In Libya, again, the international diplomatic efforts are on the forefront, and Turkey supports them. Uh, and there are reports that there, are, there have been some withdrawing of forces from Libya. Uh, in the Caucasus, again, Turkey, all, of, of course, gave all the support to, to Azerbaijan to recover its occupied territories, but now it's the time for diplomacy. Again, Turkey is involved there. In Syria, there hasn't been much going on in the military front in last six, eight months, uh, but unfortunately, not much is going on diplomatic front either, so we are hoping to that. Uh, Again, that is kind of beyond Turkish control. We need to coordinate there with other countries and etc. So I, I would see some movements also matching the rhetoric, if not 100%, uh, but maybe let's say 30% already is uh, in being implemented. You get the phone call from Ankara and says, look, we've got isolation. We've got economic issues. We do have the Kurdish issue. It's, it's not working out well. Professor Aydin, help us, help us with our grand strategy. What do you advise Ankara to do now? Well, the, my first advice is actually to follow what they are saying. You know, uh, it, it is one of the uh, AKP's uh, rhetoric uh, since 2015 is that Turkey needs to increase its friends and decrease its enemies or opponents. Um, so just follow what you are saying. But you know, that aside, my uh, idea for Turkey's grand strategy is what I would call an internationalist grand strategy. Uh, moving from isolation, Turkey is a country because of its geography, because of history, because of its connection. It is a country which cannot remain in isolation. It thrives when it cooperates with countries around itself. If you put a, your foot in Istanbul, uh, which is a hub, uh, and you can fly within three and a half hours from Istanbul, you can cover uh, two thirds of world population. Uh, and you can reach most of the important capitals of the world from Istanbul in three and a half hours. 
So this is a this is a kind of a geography and locality, which provided basis for three empires. You know, three different empires use this locality to connect the world. I'm not saying that Turkey should re-embark on empire building. That's a different era. Today, you you should em- re-embark in an empire building in a different way, uh, in a in a liberal economic political connection way. And this geography allows Turkey to do that. And also, I always say and keep saying again, this geography forces Turkey to have a connection with all the countries. You cannot be in peace with one of your identities. This geography forces Turkey to be a multi-identity country. Uh, We are a Middle Eastern country, European country, uh, Eurasian country, Mediterranean country, or Caucasian country, and several others. You cannot ignore any one of these identities. So let's uh, use this geography to the benefit of the country. Let's create circles of friendship. There are These are things that are not uh, unique. Um, it's not the first time that I'm mentioning it, that many people did so, and the governments in previously, and this government too, did these things and so that my argument is let's do it again let's create trilateral connections we already have turkey azerbaijan georgia connection for example Mm -hmm. turkey um, uh, bulgaria romania connection so we can add several others as a kind of a first buffer for turkey to the connection the friends the close friends Uh, just before uh, the syrian Uh, civil war started, Turkey initiated uh, what at the time called Levant Five. Levant Five. It was a a, a kind of an economic togetherness. I wouldn't call it union, but a kind of a free trade zone with Syria, Iraq, Jordan, Turkey, Lebanon joining and open to other countries. Turkey was the initiator of the Black Sea Economic Cooperation Organization in 1990s, early 1990s. So we have this uh, potential and we have this experience. So let's put that into ground. Let's normalize our relations with Israel. Let's normalize our relations with Egypt. With these two countries, there are no real strategic or security reasons why we should not normalize immediately. Let's look at, for example, a repetition of Black Sea Economic Cooperation example in the Eastern Mediterranean. Why not creating an Eastern Mediterranean economic zone? Um, so we have this example. I, I take the examples from Turkish recent Turkish history, not long back or not from any country. So that would be my recommendation. Look back to Turkey's limitations. Look back to Turkey's uh, powers. We have a power of geography. We have a power of history. We have a power of connection. As Turkish business people, when they go to Central Asia, they survive there very well. You know, they thrive there much better than the Western counterparts. Same in Russia, same in Arab countries, same in North North Africa. So why don't we use this kind of power sources that we have instead of uh, pushing uh, all the countries and demanding, uh, coming up with demanding proposition, which we know that they cannot do anyway. so that's my, uh, my recommendation. Increase your friends and decrease your opponents in international relations. I look forward very much to these recommendations making their way through the foreign ministry and into the presidency. Um, but for now, let me thank you, uh, Mustafa Aydin, uh, for what has been, an, I guess, an illuminating introduction to grand strategy, how difficult it is to achieve it in practice and what might be done to, as you say, get 30% of the way there in the near future. Let me thank the folks at Deep Dive Politics for putting this all together for you. And let me thank most of all you dear viewers uh, for joining me on this journey to learn just a bit more about what we might be seeing from Turkey in the near future or what we should be seeing from it. Uh, For now, however, uh, let me uh, remind you that you can also keep up to date with us on Twitter at dive underscore politics, on Facebook at deep dive politics, 
all of our videos are on our YouTube channel, but you can also follow all of us on audio if you prefer on podcast at Spotify. For now, stay safe, stay sane, be decent to each other. I'm Scott Lucas, and this has been World Unfiltered. Thank you.